of the cross. And the cross has a very central par, uh, part and position in our church, in our life. We hear a lot about freedom, like uh, going to an election season and you have the right to vote and there everybody is expressing his right to vote and to choose freely, freedom of speech, freedom. Um, we are a free country. Uh, everyone is free. Nobody can force you to do anything. And we hear the word freedom or free or liberal or um, so on in many conversations. And we need to think a little bit about what does it really mean to be a free person? In the world around us, you are free to choose. You have a choice. You have a choice to um, have a good life. You have a choice to go to school. Nobody is really forcing you unless you are a minor. I'm talking about mainly about adult and <clears throat> Uh, post um, uh, secondary school, uh, post high school, you have a choice to work or to stay home. You have a choice to have a family or to stay single. You have a choice in every single aspect of our life. And we think that is the meaning of the freedom is to have the choice. However, the true meaning of freedom is not to have the choice only but to act on it. For example, I would like to have a healthy lifestyle. I choose to have a healthy lifestyle. Eat less fat, eat less carbohydrate, exercise more, go to, the, go to the gym. It's a choice, but can I really do it? Do I have the enough power to do this choice that I made or to execute this choice that I make? Another example, I want to have a happy life. I choose to have a happy life. But every single day at work, at school, in family, with my partner or with my friends, with my brother and sisters, we have conflicts. So the fact that we are having a choice, let me, let me share the screen. Sure. Mm. Do I feel the screen? Yes. Okay. So the fact that I'm free to choose between different topics is not enough. I need a freedom that empowers me to do what I really want. Mm -hmm. And sorry, I need to make it silent. Saint Paul talked about this, that the good things that I want to do, I cannot do. And I'm forced to do the bad things. Who is forcing me? The community, the peer pressure, um, my desires, my uh, lusts, evil. So I want to do something good. I want to be healthy. I want to be happy. I want to be rich. I want to be productive. Rich mean uh, rich personality, not just money. Uh, I want to live a true Christian life. But I have something inside me and around me that is preventing me of doing what I choose and pushing me towards the direction against my will. So, indeed, I am not actually free. For example, if we are talking um, about... Recreational marijuana, for example, very common in, in today's topic discussions every day. They said, like, oh, you know what? Sorry. My computer is not working. Recreational marijuana, for example, or uh, uh, bodily relationship uh, between um, couples before marriage or any type of behavior that people can say I'm free to choose how to live Do, are they are those people really free or they are actually enslaved to a desire 
like in every one of us, we have levels. We have the body that needs to eat, drink, reproduce, sleep, have fun. We have our emotion, we need to love and to be loved. And we have our mind that need to connect with a like mind, that need to worship God, that need to live in, live in peace. And the mind and the spirit are kind of connected to each one. So, if for example, I'm going to a party and I have a very good dessert that I like and I start eating, I start eating again and again and again. At the end of the party, I'll have a blood sugar of 600. I'll be in a coma because I choose to do that. But does, is this really a good thing or a um, defying thing or a suitable thing for myself, for my health and my future and my well-being? No. I choose to do the thing that will harm me. So I'm not free. My body, my lust, my desires are controlling me. And the mind and the spirit are out of control. They cannot really go and intervene or prevent me of, from doing stuff that apparently I freely choose them, but actually I am enslaved to those things. And you can name it. Um, screen time and uh, like Facebook addiction, which I'm addicted to, kind of. Food, drugs smoking, alcohol, inappropriate relations, abusive relations, um, laziness, anything that is controlling me, I'm actually enslaved to it. Although from the outside, it's like I'm free. Uh, I want to sleep now, I go to sleep. I want to eat now, I go to eat. I don't want to study now, I'm free. I do whatever I want. But indeed, that's kind of slavery because I'm not in control. I'm doing things that I'm pushed to do through my body or through the community surrounding me or the society surrounding me. It's a Saturday night. You should stay home, study, or prepare for uh, church the next day. But all my friends in high school or college are going out to party. And they're pressuring me. They are pushing me to do, to do and party with them, to go and party with them. Is having fun wrong? No, but is it really building a strong personality? Is it really edifying? Is it really suiting my personality? No. What if I go with them? I'm pushed. I'm enslaved to the norms of the society. So St. Paul also spoke about, uh, actually Jesus spoke about it, slavery and sonship. We are called to be sons of Christ, son of God. And when we are son, we are alike. Like, for example, I just have a baby, got a baby. He looks like me. He looks like his mother. That's by nature. So when God adopts us to himself, we are called to look like him, to behave like him, to think like him, to act like him, and to have the will like him, and to have the power like him, and to be free like him. Christ himself, when he came and took our flesh, he went to the cross freely by his own free will. Nobody forced him. And he, can, he could easily destroy all the soldiers, all the Jews, and uh, save himself from the cross. At least that's what the two thieves were thinking when, when they were crucified with him. But God chose freely with his own will, with his own power to go and put off his put down his life for us, to adopt us in him. Because our flesh, our body, was enslaved to sin. Let's see what Jesus was saying. Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin, and a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son, the son of God, makes you free, you shall be free indeed. If the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. And that's the action of cross. What does the cross mean? The cross means that death and life. Putting away something to gain a better thing. Sacrifice and victory. That's the cross of Jesus. 
And we are all called to carry and to follow the, the cross, to bear the cross, like Jesus did, like the saints did. Because once I put in my mind that I need to give up something in order to live as a Christian, I will be a true son of God. But how we can get that? Like, I can... It's very hard to control, for example, my desire to do anything uh, funny or anything um, or to eat as much as I can or to spend hours binge watching TV, which I sometimes do when I have time. So it's very hard. How we can do this? How we can get the power of the cross, the death and resurrection of Christ in our life? Through something called mortification. Mortification means... I kill something in my life. St. Paul is saying, I have been crucified with Christ. Every time I give up something, I am crucified with Christ. Every time I don't go into conflict with my parents, with my friends, I've been crucified with Christ. Every time I go to the second mile, I help some, someone else. Every time I spend time doing or hel uh, helping or doing good things, that's a crucifixion. That's a mortification. That putting to death. Mortification means putting to death. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. So it's not Stephen. It's not Sonia. It's not Manuel. It's not John. Joy. It's not Sharif. But Christ lives in me. It's no longer I who live. But Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in flesh everyday life, I live by faith in Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So, once we accept Christ as a Savior, and once we ask his help to change our life, that's going through the cross. We put something to die in our life in order to gain a better life with Christ. Imagine, for example, a young man or a young lady going to early years of college. And there's two ways of going during college, for example, or at work or whatever. One is abiding by Christ's message, living a pure life, living a life of charity, living a life of purity. And the other way is having a false freedom do whatever I want in any time I want. Let my body control me. Let my emotions control me. Shut down my mind. If they're going binge watching something, I go with them. If they're going doing inappropriate stuff, I go with them. I don't want to have control of myself. I want to live free. There are two ways. Every time I choose to go the right way with Christ, I'm actually crucified with Christ. Every time I train myself to control my desires, it's a mortification. It's a crucifixion with Christ. So what about training? For example, if you go to the gym and you put a, a target, by the end of the summer, I should lose five pounds and I should strengthen my core muscle or I should build a little bit of the biceps or triceps. So I have a goal. That's a freedom of choice. I choose to be healthy. But what is the empowering factor here? Is I need to have the freedom of doing it. I need to have control from my mind on my body. To tell my body, you need to labor. You need to work hard in the gym. You need to control yourself. So there's a control from up here, down there. And every day I'm training myself more and more. That's a sort of crucifixion of mortification. It's the same in our spiritual and uh, um, practical life. For example, I train myself that every day before going to bed, I need to make it for a short prayer, five minutes. I train myself. This year will be five, next year will be ten. I train myself that before going to work or to school or uh, starting my day, I need to have like two or three minutes to read the Bible to guide my mind and my spirit during the day. I train myself. 
instead of spending an hour or two hours doing like seemingly uh, useless activities or useless stuff, useless stuff, I take from from this time and specify it for something beneficial, something edifying, something profitable for me. So that's how we take the blessing and the power, the empowering freedom of the cross in our life by training. Every day I train myself. I do the mortification action. I do the crucifixion. So one can ask me, it's too hard to do it. Like um, we are talking in a theoretical way. We are talking in an um, abstract way. It's not practical. It's too hard to train ourselves to do all time good things or to follow Christ at all time because the world is fighting against our principles. The world is fighting against our spiritual values. That's true. If you are depending on our own will or our own power, we will fail and we fail multiple times. Guess how many times you, uh, I try to control my anger by my own power and I failed. Uh, guess how many times I try to control my desire to eat sweets all time and I failed because I'm depending on my own power. How many times I try to control my thoughts, my eye, my, uh, my tongue and I failed because actually the inner power of the cross is an action of grace and not an action of self-control. What does this mean? In our rituals, we pray to the crucified God, like this is a part of the litanies of the sixth hour. During the sixth hour, we commemorate the crucifixion of Christ. With Jesus Christ, our God, who was nailed to the cross in six hours and killed sin by tree. So we remember that he killed the sin we were enslaved to the sin, but now we are free from the sin if we follow God. And by your death, you made alive the dead man whom you created with your own hands and had died in sin. Put to death our pains by your healing and life-giving passions. This is the most important one that, uh, sentence that we need to focus on. Put to death our pains by your healing and life-giving passions and by the nails which you with which you are nailed, rescue our minds from thoughtfulness of earthly deeds. So the power of the cross, the empowering freedom of the cross, is an act of grace. God, in his abundant grace, will offer this freely to us, only if we ask it, if we ask for it. Here we are praying for the crucified Jesus, for the crucified God. Give us this power. Put to death our pains. So we need to ask. We need constantly to ask, to acknowledge that we are weak. By our own will, by our own power, we cannot be free. And we tried many times. And every time we are enslaved again to the sin, we cannot be free by our own will or by our own power. It's not just, okay, you know what? I will stop watching this particular movie or this particular series. I will not go to the fridge, I will control my thoughts. By our own will, we fail every single time. That's why, for example, we see conflicts in families, because both the husband and the wife, they are trying to control their anger during day-to-day -day troubles or day-to-day -day, uh, struggles by their own power and not asking God to intervene not carrying the cross with God, not being crucified with Christ. Here, if we ask and we pray, this we pray this litany supposedly every day at noon. If we pray every day, God himself by his abundant grace will intervene. But again, we need to give place to God in our life. Like we ask for his grace, we ask, by the power of cross, by the power of your blood, Jesus, Come and put to death my pain, my pain, my sins, my desires, my anger, my frustration, my depression, my anxiety, 
um, my sadness, my difficult times, put to death all those problems. But I will leave a space for you to come and do your work. Imagine, for example, you are hiring somebody to fix the TV or to fix the heat system or to do maintenance for the AC or whatever. And he's telling you, okay, because you are the customer number 1000, I'll come and do it for free for you. We'll do the whole maintenance of the house, a $1,000 workup. We'll do it for free. Okay, good, very great. Good, very great. Come next Saturday. And when he comes next Saturday, you blocked all the way to the AC, to the HVAC. You are closing the doors and you left the house. He's coming for free, but you close the door. That's the same. The grace, the abundant grace of God is for free, is rich and for free. But we sometimes close the door. We don't want to go to the cross with Christ. We want to live our relaxed, chill out, lazy life. The false freedom of the world. We don't want to get out of our comfort zone and explore a trip with Christ and explore an adventure with Christ where we can put to death the evil things in us and explore the abundant richness of the grace of God in our life, the resurrection of Christ in our life. So it's a choice here. We choose to ask for the grace of God, the powerful and empowering freedom of the cross, and we leave a space in our life for God to work. We don't put stumbling blocks in front of the grace. And initially, this might be a little bit hard. But if every day we do the exercise, the spiritual exercise of praying and asking God grace and trying not to put stumbling blocks in front of God grace, which is mainly our ego, is the biggest stumbling block in front of the grace, gradually the grace of God, the empowering freedom of the cross will work on us. And we can look back to like a couple of years ago, before we knew Christ or before we submit our life to Christ and say, oh, that was, that was bad. How come I used to do such and such and such? How come I used to like not to go to church on a regular basis? How come I was not confessing? How come I was not reading the Bible? Now I'm experiencing the power, the freedom, the grace of God in my life. So if today we can get one lesson, is to ask God to put to death our pains by the cross and to look at the cross every day and see how God suffered for us. And we are called not to suffer, but to carry our cross and not to kill our flesh, but to, to kill or to put to death or to mortify the evil, do uh, the evil stuff in our life. If we take this exercise and pray every day, put to death our pains, put to death our pains. And whenever we are going into conflict, into trouble, into hard time at work, at school, and during life, we just mentioned this small litany, the small prayer, put to death our pains. God will intervene by his grace and the powerful and empowering freedom of the cross and will change our life. Those who live with Christ, bearing their cross, their life will change. So those who don't want to live with, uh, with Christ, who don't want to bear their cross, their life will be the same day after day. So the church, our church is very rich in rituals. And the rituals are not just habits, are not just like, oh, things uh, old people told us to do so, or... Uh, five centuries ago, 10 centuries ago, they did so, so we are repeating it without understanding. The rituals of the Orthodox Church are rich. And the Church is putting the cross in front of us in every single day in the prayer of the six hour. In every single week, we fast on Friday in three different occasions during the year. 
Feast of the Cross in March, Feast of the Cross in September, which is tomorrow and day after tomorrow, and the Good Friday at the end of the Great Lent. The stories of the Feast of Cross are a little bit interesting. The first uh, Feast of Cross in March, which is uh, 10 of uh, Baramhat, is the discovery of the cross. The whole Roman Empire was pagan, the church was suffering, and then the Emperor Constantine started to think about religious freedom. We need to make the Christian free, true freedom. We want to make other religion to uh, practice freely, not the pagan religions, but also Christian religion. And then he was kind of asking, what about Christianity? What is that? And he was going to a war against his enemies. And during the war, he had a very interesting dream. A sign in the sky between clouds, the sign of the cross. He didn't know what is that. And this voice telling him, in this conquer, for those who understand Arabic, uh, Jean and Joy, in this conquer. So he was asking, what is that sign? So his like friends and counselors said, oh, that's the cross of the Christians. What about we put this symbol, the sign on all the arms, all uh, the weapons, while you are going uh, into the battle against our enemies? And the war was a very difficult one, but he conquered them. And that's a symbol of our spiritual work against evil. In this conquer, or with this you conquer. So he started asking, and like the people around him start to tell him about Christianity. His mother, Queen Helen, went to Jerusalem and looked about, uh, where was the cross. And she found it buried under trash piles. She found three crosses and she prayed and the bishop prayed. And there was a, fu uh, there was a, <clears throat> sorry, there were a funeral uh, passing by and they put the crosses, the three crosses, on the coffin, in the third cross, the, uh, the dead man resurrected. So they knew that this is the life-giving wood of the cross. The second, uh, fast that we are, the second feast that we are celebrating now is when the, uh, the cross itself was stolen by the Persian, and then they brought it back in big celebration. So the church, because it has very rich ritual, there, she's putting, the church is putting the cross in front of us every day, every week, and three times per year. During the two feasts of the cross, the one in March and the one in September, we sing the tunes in the Palm Sunday tune. Why? Because God is a king, and his kingdom is on the cross. Lord has reigned on the wood, on the pole of wood, which is a cross. And we declare that our kingdom is not like the regular kingdom, it's not like the regular civilization. No, it's a kingdom of the cross, kingdom of crucifixion. The kingdom, every one of it, every member of, of this kingdom will put something to death, will mortify something, will give up something, will give up some leisure time, will give up some food, will give up some uh, relaxation, we'll give up some sins, we'll give up some fun in order to obtain the resurrection of Christ, in order to enjoy the abundant grace of the freedom giving and life giving cross. And during those two feasts, we are celebrating Christ as a king, a king on the cross, but also we are celebrating all the people who carried the cross. And it's a very nice exercise to think about people who carried the cross before us. Not only the saints. For example, our parents who came from Egypt and like established a career here, established a family here, they bear their cross by coming to church. And I know some people um, in, in Stanton Church 
Like they used to drive four or five hours to go to church when there was no church near them. They bared the cross. <clears throat> or, for example, um, priests who are traveling in between churches to uh, preach the gospel, they bear the cross. Sunday school servants, deacons, regular people like each one of you travel for, uh, for, for quite a bit to come to the church. Um, he's bearing the cross. So it's good to think about people who are bearing the cross to learn from them. So the church arranged a procession of the cross each on, on those two feasts, the feast in March and the feast in September, before the liturgy, during the matins. We have 12 stations, the Virgin Mary, Archangel Gabriel, St. Mark, St. John the Baptist, St. Anthony, St. George, and other stations, where we remember or we try to learn from those saints or those occasions how they bear the cross, how they lived in a life of crucifixion with Christ, how they themselves put to death their own desires and enjoyed the freedom of the cross. For example, St. George, he was a soldier, he was strong, he was handsome, he was, he, was, he was a prince, but he didn't consider any of that. And he put to death all of his life, all of his pleasures, all of his benefits, all of his career in order to follow Christ. And then at the end, he resurrected with Christ. St. Mark the same. Archangel Gabriel, for example, he, uh, um, he announced the good news for Mary that she will bear the cross. So this is a very joyful procession. If you have time, attend with Abuna tomorrow. Unfortunately, I cannot attend because um, we have reservation here. So it's a very joyful procession. It takes about 40 minutes or so. We stand in front of those 12 icons, those 12 saints or occasions. We read a short passage of the gospel and then we sing in the tune of the Palm Sunday. Hail to you the cross, the symbol of victory, the sign of victory. Hail to, hail to the crucifixion of the Lord. Hail to, uh, or, or share a, uh, hail to St. Mark, hail to St. George. They bear the cross, they carry the cross with Jesus, and then they are resurrected. So in our ritual um, uh, um, year, we start with the Feast of Nairuz, or the Feast of the New Coptic year, which is always on the 11th of September, or 9-11 or 9-12. And then the first big feast of the Coptic liturgical year or ritual year is the Feast of the Cross. Because we declare that through cross we'll get all the good, uh, the good news of Christianity. Through cross we get all the blessing. Through, through the cross we get all the grace. Through the cross we get all the empowering freedom. And as we said in the beginning, the cross is the ever flowing fountain of freedom. Each time you feel that you are enslaved to a sin, to a thought, to depression, to sadness, look to the cross and pray the prayer that we agreed to pray together. Put to death our pains by your healing and life-giving passions. A short prayer, if we pray it faithfully from our heart, and we, if we give place to the grace, to the abundant grace of Christ, it will change our life and we'll live really a free life in Christ and freedom, not just freedom of choice, but freedom of action, freedom to change, freedom to act on, upon on our weak point and change our life to a glorious, more, uh, a more and more glorious life with Christ and glory be to God forever. Amen. Any questions? Thank you so much, Dr. Sharif. I had a question. Sure, see you. So alongside this prayer, could you just go over like the daily things that you talked about, like in order to attain grace of the cross? So in order to obtain grace of the cross, we need to do two things. One, to ask 
faithfully for the grace, like to ask God to come with his grace and fill up our, fill our heart and fill our life. That's through prayer, sincere prayer, not long prayer, sincere. And the second thing, the most important, is to give place to the grace in our life, give space to the power of cross in our life. And the things that inhibit or, or prevent the power and the grace of Christ to work in our life is our ego. Each time we put our ego apart, he said, you know what, I'm, I want to do this, but I'm not doing it. Um, I, uh, this particular person is annoying me, but I'm not like paying him back. Uh, my siblings, my family, uh, they don't understand me, but I'm not going to conflict with them. This putting away our ego or putting down our ego, this will leave space for the Holy Spirit, the power of the cross, the grace of God to work in us. We don't need to put stumbling blocks in front of the grace, the grace of God. So just simple action. And take it simply, the life with Christ is not complex, it's not uh, a mental exercise, it's not, uh, it's a struggle in a way, but it's simple. Ask and leave a space. Pray and don't put stumbling block in front of the grace of God. And the grace of God will work abundantly in our life. So how we can know the balance or who will teach us how to pray to get the grace of God and how to leave space in our life for the grace of God to work is what we call spiritual guidance. The spiritual father can tell you, you know what? In your life, you have stumbling blocks. You need to remove them. Um, maybe, you are, for example, for myself, I'm spending too much time on electronics. I need to cut down a little bit. Or for somebody else, 